Hello everyone, I'm George from Ireland. So behind me is the Eric Liddell Centre. I believe it's pronounced Liddell, not Liddell. This former church. Now, um, Eric Liddell is um, renowned for his performance in the 1924 um, Paris uh, Olympics. So Liddell was born in China in 1902 to British missionary parents. Uh, so he's the first uh, Olympian born in China, so the Chinese sometimes claim him as one of, as one of their own, though he was never a Chinese citizen. Um, his parents were bringing the gospel to the benighted heathen as they saw it. Uh, the Chinese would often regard them as religious imperialists, and imperialist is, is not a compliment in Cathay. Anyhow, when he was little, um, his family returned to these shores, and uh, they put him and his brother into a school in Eltham, which is in London, for the sons of missionaries. The parents then returned to the Far East with, uh, with, with uh, Liddell's um, sister and they carried on um, evangelizing for Jesus Christ. So uh, Liddell excelled at school in many things, uh, particularly in sports, captained a few sports teams, fairly academic too, and he was said to be completely self-effacing, uh, just a truly good man. I don't think anyone had a bad word to say about him. Um, Anyway, so, so he was just too young for the, for the First World War and he came up to Edinburgh University because it was, it was North Britain that his parents were from and he read natural sciences. His brother Alex uh, was reading medicine. So uh, he um, competed in university athletics and I can't remember where the university ground is where he used to run. He played rugby for Scotland as well. He eventually felt he had to choose between running and rugby. In rugby there's two higher chances to sustain an injury and obviously put him out of rugby and in, but also of running for some time because his, I can't remember what his speciality was. Was it 100 meters, 200 meters, something like that. Um, so uh, he was also fired by um, his uh, Christian zeal. Um, so he uh, became a bit of a celebrity, the Flying Scotsman, they called him, complete amateur in, in, in athletics. You had to be an amateur to get into the Olympics. Uh, and was going around competing in all sorts of competitions. And famously, it was an occasion, I think it was the, an Ireland-Scotland match, or was it Ireland-Great Britain match, it was actually, although it was actually held in England, where um, he was jostled by the crowd shortly after the starting gun, gun had gone, only, only seconds into the race. And there was a 20-yard deficit between him and the pack, the other, the other runners. But he, he hesitated, got up, and then chased them, and overtook them, and won. And it was absolutely staggering. And he collapsed with the oxygen death. So he had um, this hideous running style with his arms flailing. You'd think that'd be bad for aerodynamism, and his head by, by, by this. But anyway, somehow it worked for him. So he was uh, renowned for his many, his many um, uh, feats. But one thing is, he was a strict Sabbatarian, Sabbatarian and absolutely refused to race on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day Observant Society then being a potent force. And he wouldn't train on the Lord's Day either. But that, that, that day of repose may have done him some good because the other six days he tried to tried, train even harder than the average person would. He'd had a bit of chance to, to uh, recuperate. Um, so uh, he graduated from Edinburgh University. He was carried shoulder high uh, with, with a laurel wreath that graduates sometimes wore back then. Um, and you can see outside that McEwen Hall, a famous photo of him like that. Um, he did not partake of spirituous liquor, despite the fact that um, McEwen the Brewers had most uh, liberally endowed the university, hence McEwen Hall bears its name, because of course the thirsty scholars had contributed so generously to his profits down the decades. And indeed, he wouldn't smoke either. He thought tobacco was sinful. Of course, people had no idea that tobacco was injurious to one's health. Um, anyway, so he was selected for Great Britain's athletic team uh, in the run-up to the Paris 1924 Olympics. Uh, now, he was, he was aware months in advance when the, the schedule was published that one of the heats he'd have to compete in for his event would be held on a Sunday. So he stood up to sustained pressure from the British Olympic Committee, from the establishment, even the Prince of Wales, as in future Edward VIII, that he should set aside his principle just this once. And if he did, if he won a gold Olympic a medal, then that would do so much more. It would be a gift for Christ, surely that would show divine favor, and he'd be able to win many more souls for salvation. Um, because he was such a celebrity, it appealed to people who um, were not so terribly religious. Um, he'd been used on various evangelistic missions to go and preach in, our, in uh, working class communities because they didn't care over much, some of them, about, about the gospel, but they did care about athletics or they did care about him bringing glory to Scotland or more broadly to the United Kingdom. Um, the thing is, he was actually a mediocre public speaker. You can't be fantastic at, at everything. Um, so uh, anyway, so he went to Paris and he didn't get to compete in the event, the thing he was really best at because of being on Sunday. But they put him into another race 
and he won gold that anyway. He smashed one, uh, uh, a record, a world record, and he he gained admiration from the, his American competitors, Jackson Schultz, and I can't remember the other chap. And there was also a New Zealand athlete, uh, what was his name, Porritt, that, um, who was a doctor, who was later head of the Royal Army Medical Corps, as in the most senior doctor in the British Army. That Porritt later became um, Governor General of New Zealand, and indeed uh, was the father of the uh, um, environmental campaigner, Jonathan Porritt. But uh, uh, somebody handed him a, a um, note right before the race began saying, the, the Lord says, who, who honors me, I shall honor. So it, it really buoyed him up, um, uh, Eric uh, Liddell. So he won this, he won these medals, and he stayed on in the United Kingdom about a further year before going off to China to, to start helping his father in his church. He competed in various athletic competitions there, um, and uh, he, was, he came back every few years of furlough because it was such a long voyage in those days to make it worth your while. He'd come back for about six months at a time. He was eventually ordained a minister. He was in the Congregational Church. He was the Church of Scotland. But I don't think he set up strict sectarian principles within um, uh, Protestantism. So yeah, here's more of the Eric Liddell Center. And I've been into it. So it's more of a community center. It's been deconsecrated. And um, they support people with various disabilities or people with dementia. Um, and you can hire out little rooms that can be used for community activities. Nothing that a church would consider immoral. This part of Edinburgh is called Holy Corner because of the three churches, or the former churches. This one, the Eric Liddell Center here. And then this one here, I can't remember which denomination it is, some Protestant one or other. Um, and then there's one across the way. This Morningside Road, on Morningside Road there are about seven churches within a mile, it's ridiculous. You'd swear we've got nothing else but to do, we go to, to go to church. Oh, this one says Church of Scotland. And I can't remember the one over there, we'll see. So Eric Liddell, he went off to, to um, China. He got married to the daughter of a Canadian missionary. They're blessed with three children. And um, then the Second World War broke out and the Japanese were in China with the Japanese invade, well they didn't invade the rest of China, but they weren't at war against the United Kingdom. But anyway, he was persuaded to send his, his um, two daughters, as they then were, and his pregnant wife to Canada for their own safety, and he never saw them again. But anyway, he was interned by the Japanese in the Second World War. But uh, he was a man of um, uttermost integrity, and uh, he did good things as well, like some of the wealthy internees were having um, uh, extra rations smuggled into them, so he shamed them into sharing them those with, with, with the needy. And he was uh, trusted not to be partial when the disputes between different groups and to referee various matches. But he fell ill and died in, in, in January 1924, not 1945, what we're talking about. But there was, um, there was talk of him somehow being released by the Japanese. I'm not sure why they would do that, why they want goodwill as the war was about to end. And Churchill hoped that he would be set free. And there's a story that um, the Japanese agreed to, to, to free somebody, but he said this pregnant woman should go in my place. Anyway, he died in China, indeed he's buried there behind the old the Japanese officers' quarters, that internment camp. That was 1945, it was, it was just before the end of the uh, Second World War that he died. So numerous books came out about, about him, and famously there's that book Chariots of, not books for it, sorry, there's that film Chariots of Fire, which came out about him and a number of the other notable characters, such as uh, Harold Abrahams. Harold Abrahams, who was a Jewish Cambridge graduate, um, who also competed in the same Olympics, but he lived on until 1978, became a grand old man of British sport. See this other church here, which is, I can't even, oh, I think it's Episcopalian, that denomination. You see the more flamboyant architecture. Um, so, uh, Liddell was, was portrayed by Eric, um, not by Eric, by Ian Charlson in the 1981 film. Why is it called Chariots of Fire? Because, um, well, like in the Bible, and he was a, a big man for the Bible, there was uh, the Chariots of Fire, a Chariot of Fire took Elijah up to heaven, didn't die. Um, anything else to tell you about that? Well, what a marvellous film it was, um, and I think Ian Charlson got him quite right. Charlson was a rather different character, was a much more sort of fun-loving person, I don't think remotely religious, and even wrote some of his own script, because some of the script he felt was stilted and false uh, when he was addressing some crowd after a race meeting, and he asked um, uh, Hugh Hudson, the director, whether he could uh, uh, write his own oration and deliver it, and indeed he was allowed to do so. So it won, I think won the Oscar for, for Best Director, was it Best Picture as well, in um, 1981. So it was a marvellous year for British cinematography. Gandhi came out the same year. Um, although, although the film came out in 81, it might have been in the 82 Oscars, I'm not quite sure. Unfortunately, Ian Charlson um, didn't long survive. Only a few years after that, he was, he was diagnosed HIV positive. He died of AIDS in 1991. But Ben Cross, his co-star, is still alive. There's another character in that film who's a composite of someone else. Of, um, 
one of that aristocrat lord somebody or other it was the, the old Etonian and Porritt was so self-effacing when they wanted to give credit to Porritt the New Zealand athlete in the film he declined saying no no, no you just must, must, mustn't mention my name there we are well that is a little bit about Eric Liddell who was a Christian in the best sense of the word word toodaloo